A lot of people are turning up early, which is good. And tickets and stuff sold out, so. Completely sold out. Completely. Is it 10 euros? Is it? Oh, oh wait a second. <gasps> what the f? What the f? Yeah. It's making fun of you, it's playing a trick on you. It's, it's, only, it's only a piece of paper. Oh, this is French. It says, uh, it's just playing a trick on you. Translation. Yeah. Yeah, look how it controls you. It controls you. It's just playing a trick on your mind. Don't be a slave. So, so yeah, that's it. This is what we have to do after Z Day. A two month period of Operation Money Crackdown. I uploaded the editable version. Yes. So everywhere in the world. Yes, oh, I saw it. We have to make it worldwide. We have to gather all the videos on a Dropbox and then we have to make a collaborative video to, to go viral on YouTube. It's so much data. It gets, it gets so much data and it comes from so many different angles that you're left with more or less a confused feeling about it. But he draws conclusions throughout the entire thing. So these conclusions are hit, but they're not really convinced based on the data that's set up. Yeah. It's astounding. This book goes all the way through, and he's kind of like, no, of um, oh yeah, you know, obviously like everybody needs money to survive, but bonuses aren't you know, they're really, you know, because because that that elicits no, people, you know, that's a reward mechanism. And I'm like, out. what the hell do you think this is? And Christians grew up with the Arab values, right? But I mean, in the end, I think I think. But I reach the sky by my side. I could in my store in a blaze of blood. And I'm afraid my disposition is the same as it was 75 years ago. This shit's got to go. Enjoy the communist propaganda. <laughs> How many times do you have to hear that? The logic is undeniable. Um, there's no two ways about it for me. Um, unfortunately, I'm feeling quite emotional at the moment. Give me a moment. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, though, because people can be quite superficial when you're talking to them about this idea. Um, what would you say to anybody who just doesn't like the idea of the planet turning into a mass of circular cities and potentially destroying the landscape of our cultural heritage? Well, cultural, <coughs> the cultural heritage always changes. It's a, always a process of evolution. So I think, you know, when people are romantically inclined to support this system, I try to call them out on the fact that throughout the entire history of humanity, we've constantly changed. We've constantly evolved and done different things, typically associated with the advancement of technology. As far as the circular cities, not everything has to be circular. I think there's a misconception. People see that and they think that, well, you know, the ideal, as pointed out, I talk about the logic of simply having a circular city. You know, it's equidistant. Uh, you, can, you can move more easily. It's just, a, it's an ideal. Uh, Jock designs all sorts of city structures. Many of them are very much almost traditional, if you will. They're meandering. Different land masses have different requirements. It's the mechanics of it that's important. It's the sustainability attributes. It's, it's making things uh, as efficient as possible with the most efficient use of energy, with the allocation of where, 
where uh, the food supply is going to come from. All the attributes that are talked about in the film, it's really the design, excuse me, it's the logic of the design, not the design itself. The logic makes the design. So you could have a very different visual structure in different locations depending on what you have. Like if you're in a big geothermal region, you might have a very different structure based around where the residential areas are when they gain power from geothermal. And the industrial center could be off to a completely different area. So you, you see my point? So it's, it's explicitly based on the reasoning of the region. So it builds itself. That's the beauty of the, res the resource-based economy is it, it's self-defining if the interest is to be at peak sustainability, which is the term that I use. Does that make sense? Yeah, and um, in terms of efficiency, I don't think anybody can disagree. Uh, I think people, are, sometimes they bug about the, the um, character being lost. Yeah, I understand that. Again, it's a romanticism. You know, people, I think if we look back into, it, well, you go to ancient, ancient Rome and you look at the ruins and you think to yourself, maybe New York City would look like some atrocity to those living, living in the Roman, Roman Empire. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, 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 we don't have the luxury at this day and age to worry about ostentatious aesthetic issues as far as I'm concerned. To me, in my personal opinion, I think it's beautiful. I like the way an airplane looks because it's efficient. They can't create little ornaments on it because it's defined by the artist. The artistic attribute is defined by the efficiency that's required. I think in all of Jacques' designs, people say, oh, you're very creative. And he'll actually sit and explain everything that comprises the curves and why they reflect the style that they do. There's a reason, it's utilitarian. But it's also artistic in its, in its inevitable natural formation, driven, driven, excuse me, derived logically, inferentially, from the need to be sustainable and efficient at all costs. So I just think, to me, the warmest thing I could ever see is really a, a beautiful building that's designed beautifully to be sustainable. Not what it looks like, not the ornament and the fixtures, but the fact that it works so incredibly well. To me, that's, that, that's my romanticism. I'm, I'm attracted to that as, as beauty on every level. So there's differences of opinion. So that's kind of what I would say. I would challenge someone's opinion, say, well, I think differently than that. Do you, would you prefer to live in a really efficient, inefficient hut that has no heat, you know, that can't, that can't support you, that it is not self-enclosed, that requires all this external stuff and maintenance, or would you like to have a home that can last your entire lifetime with virtually no maintenance, that is self-sufficient, self-supporting? I think if you draw the utilitarian arguments uh, you bring them up to people, they'll, they'll quickly concede, I think, you know. I mean, what, what matters in the end? Does it really matter what, what things look like you know, in the long run? I mean, I think we tend to be aesthetically driven just because we grow up into it and we identify with it. You know, I, I have plenty of artistic things and visual things that I identify with that I, th I think are beautiful. Walking around London, there's always just amazing old architecture, but I see it and I appreciate it for the romanticism of it, but I also know that things change and it's more important, I think our survival is more important than uh, efficient survival in the long run is more important than just, you know, the aesthetic romanticism. So I think most would agree in the long run, but, I, but that's an argument that you can use if you can counter someone that says, oh, I don't want to live in that, it's ugly. Well, what kind of rationality is that, you know? Okay. Uh, hi, Peter. Um, Films are great. <laughs> um, my name's James. I'm a researcher at Oxford University in environmental studies. Okay. Um, and I also want to riff on this theme of efficiency, um, ask you a question about efficiency. Um, it seems to me that the, the efficiency that is required to sort of um, bring about global sustainability um, and sort of equality for, for everybody, that's a function of sort of three things really. The, the resources we have available, um, the population of the planet, and um, the sort of the, the quality of life that we want. And until we, we've determined what those three things are, do you think there's a danger in saying things like efficiency at all costs, given that that could lead to a, a loss of certain um, cultural uh, attributes like architecture um, that, that the people appreciate in the here and now? Well, uh, efficiency at all costs, I think, is simply a general rule that, you know, we could get to a point where the efficiency, the, you know, that extra 1% of efficiency is not necessary. You don't have to go through that just to get that little extra bit because maybe things are so sustainable that there's such an ease already and this population is satisfied that it's not necessary. Um, to go back to the third point you mentioned in that list that you had regarding where the needs are, 
really, in effect, our needs should be related to what is possible with the internal structure, the inferential logic coming up from what I call natural law, based on what the Earth can support, based on what we're defined by the environment that we're born into, and we have to align with it. So the maximization of utility, if you will, of this, this approach really defines our needs. And we really have no choice but to kind of fall in line with natural law, you know what I mean? I, I really, I, people have a, a tendency to be very personal in their lives, personal in their views, thinking that, that they have some freedom of thought that somehow exceeds their, their reality. I'm sorry, that doesn't really work that way. Uh, we, we have to align with things and our values should be derived. So it goes the other way around is my point. Yeah, as an environmentalist, I'm very sympathetic to that argument. Um, but my, my point is that um, I think we, we, we could get to a, to a stage where we can produce, um, where we don't have to be super, super, super efficient, where everything doesn't have to be round, if you see what I mean. Right, yeah, um, well, yeah, I understand. And sort of how do you determine that? Well, that, that's what I just commented on, that extra 1%, or that extra 5%, or that extra 10%. I, I mean, we don't, it's not like it to be a stickler and go, well, if we have to do all this and this and this. If things are working properly, and it's sustainable, and there's limited ne negative retroactions, and it, everyone's happy, we don't have some kind of you know, deep, you know, uh, we don't have poverty here, or we don't have pollution here, or deforestation here, or, or peak oil here, or any kind of peak resource. If everything is in balance and it's being maintained, then it becomes kind of a mood issue. If it's working and everyone's satisfied, there's no reason to have to go to some crazy, you know, extreme length of efficiency. Sure. Okay, uh, can we go to the right now? Is that this person here, Eduardo? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Good. Um, yeah, I just want to say um, I've been successfully brainwashed by your movie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <laughs> job done. Um, I wanted to say I thought I think the film's amazing at dissecting the evils inherent in our money system, which are palpable and there for everyone to see. I also think it's a great um, advert for your resource-based economy. It, it looks a bit like utopia porn to me it's, um, in some instances. Excuse me, can you, can you ask the question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, what I'm basically saying is I, I think the film's weak in terms of describing the transition from the place we're in now to sure. the place that you're advertising. And that, that's the real problem that I have with it. I can't wait to be in that world, but sure. how do we get there? Well, that's the... Uh... <clears throat> That's the, that's the million dollar question. That's why we're here and that's why there's an event tomorrow. That's why the Zeitgeist Movement exists. You know, I, there's only so much I as an individual and my, my conditioning, my temperament, and my, my intellectual capacity can say I couldn't sit here and tell you how to, quote, change the world. That's gonna come from another place. That's gonna come from, well, first of all, it's gonna, it's gonna be uh, navigated dynamically by what I consider to be the collapse of civilization because of what's outlined in the film. You're gonna have problems and pressures that are gonna emerge, and you're gonna have people seeking solutions to override them. And the hopeful, the hopeful thing that will happen is that this type of direction, this logic will pull through, as opposed to people falling back on some other outdated view. Uh, critical mass, though, is really what I'm going for here. As I, in Zeitgeist Addendum, it started there, where I, I made that point about the need for critical mass, and it's, if uh, you know, this film doesn't carry over into the activist angle, but in the Zeitgeist Movement, I talked to extensive lengths about the need to get people together across the world. And once you have enough people, you begin to put pressure on the establishment. You begin to have you know, more, um, well, you begin to have economic conferences with scientists that are behind it that can show the complete redesign of North America, that show how you can, boom, here it is. And you get other country leaders or whomever to start to think about it. And you, in my mind, you develop a parallel structure, a parallel group of people that want to do something completely different. And hopefully, again, the logic will pull through and the timing will be such that it hits a tipping point and the powers that be are willing to accept or maybe will be forced to accept based on you know, the uprising and the civil unrest and everything else that's happening, which I think will continue. Uh, that's how I see it, loosely speaking, a transition occur. But there's so many things that you really can't predict. So, but at the very base level, you have to get the world to want it. You have to get people across the world, across all borders, because this is a global concept uh, to want this. Can I just say as well, it's, it struck me that it wouldn't be pot, 
is this is the sort of thing that everybody has to sign up to in order for it to work, surely? If you're talking globally, well, what, what, what are you going to do with people that insist on being irrational? Well, well I, I think the term... Well, okay, the Amish exist today. The Amish have isolated communities. The Amish have chosen to live lifestyles. And there are many other you know, religiously-oriented subcultures that, that live very, very differently than the modern capitalist you know, global society that we have now. So you can accommodate those things. If someone doesn't see the efficiency, if they're really against it, there's no reason that, you know, that there's some animosity there. But they have to understand that if... I don't know, 60% of the world population wants to live in a resource-based economy and 40% don't, well, you can only hope that a comp compromise can be made. But I think actually those statistics that I just mentioned are kind of inaccurate. It'd be more like 90% of the population wants to live because you really do need global resource access, back to your first point. And then the other 10% can be supplied with what they need. But the, what would you do if you were the other 10% and you're watching everyone live in a very nice, I mean, you know what I mean? So I believe that they would come over to the other side to see the fruits of this. In fact, I, I have more respect for the Amish and these simplistic, more simplistic subcultures than I do for this modern capitalist world that's hell-bent on destroying itself. So, see my point, you know, it it's really comes down to where the, the stability is. And I think that in, our, uh, in the education of anyone, they'll begin to reconcile that it's in their best interest to join a system that's actually sustainable and hopefully progressive and be willing to accept those changes. Um, and, and developing skills, I think, is very important. It's, it's the I third agree. linchpin, along with the resource-based economy, technology, and human skills, and develop those abilities. I agree, I agree. Thank you. I mean, that's uh, what, essentially, that we're trying to do. I mean, the, uh, as far as the city, though, as you mentioned, building the city, Building a test city, building something that we can show the world what's, what's capable is the intent. Building an isolated community, though, and shutting yourself off and saying, OK, we have our, we have our sustainable city, that's not going to fly in the current climate. So I just want to reiterate that if anyone thinks that that's a solution. There's nowhere to hide anymore. Uh, it, it's either the world learns that its survival is contingent upon it, learning to work together, or it continues its, its slow, grueling breakdown. Pretty much agree with everything you've just said there in terms of how the world's going to go. Um, I've spoken to many, many people who read, who are intelligent, and, and a lot of them didn't know who you or even Jacques were. Sure. And he's been around for ages. Sure. So my question to you would be, obviously it would take a catastrophe to get to the point of change. What could you guys do more mainstream, i.e. Discovery Channel, to to get this documentary out there, not amongst small groups like this, but mainstream. I've spoken to so many people and they do not know what the Zeitgeist Movement is. Well, we're, I consider, I mean, if you really think about it, with, it's definitely an infancy stage. If you compare our numbers and our reach uh, with, with, by the way, no heavy monetary contribution, this is all volunteer and independent, people are doing this on their own accord, which is very powerful, by the way. But if you compare ourselves to other, other activist organizations or what you want to call them, it took them much longer to achieve the audience and the group that we have. So I think in the angle of progress, for what is really only about two years, ultimately, I think it's quite, quite effective and quite profound. I'm trying to get the documentary on the documentary film channel. I've had you know, communication with various, various organizations to do whatever I can. I, and plus, of course, anyone can show the film. I, I give the film, essentially, out. Any television station can basically show it, as long as they don't exploit it. And I don't, I don't require any type of money for it, which is quite an incentive for them, because there is an audience, and all they see is dollar signs and everything else. But I guess there'll be a few company owners that have investments in certain places that will really want this document on, I would guess. I'm sorry, say that again? I guess there'd be a, a lot of directors, company owners that are capitalists. In, in, well, that's all they, they want. Well, this really is want the system we live on. in. That's what they see. They see dollar signs. So if they see an audience... You know, that's just a sad reality of it, why they would rationalize it, unless you occasionally get somebody that's in the mainstream that really believes in it and they can slide it in, which does occasionally happen in certain contexts. But, um, but I think the progress is there, and I'm doing the best I can. That's the, the movie was made in more of a, quote, high-budget kind of way with, with a much bigger spread to try to appeal to a diverse group as possible. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. It's really just up to everybody to continue. So what, um, what could we do as individuals... I mean, I work as a recruitment consultant, which effectively is, is against all the things I'm watching here, but it's what I do for a living. <laughs> you know? but, but I've started to go into work feeling like 
I don't really want to do this because it's all about money and profit. What, what does the average person is just trying to get by? Well, this do? is the complex reality. I mean, we have you have to walk a dual line if you believe in this type of direction because you can't just throw everything down and assume this is going to happen tomorrow. You can't just uh, disregard money and and your future. The, it's it is uh, it's paradoxical in a state of mind. So what I kind of tell people is. You kind of have to wear the movement on your, your shoulder, and you have to make it a part of your general life. You have to know that you have to submit to the system. If you have the option, if you're in college, try to do something that has some type of social benefit. Don't do what I was forced into and be in advertising for a while. Don't try to stay away from all of the, the parasitic industries and things that really do nothing at all. And there's a number of them. Uh, try to do something in, you know, in uh, advanced, uh, in tele, uh, excuse me, in uh, programming, things that relate to uh, design and computers. Computers obviously are not going to stop in their progression and effect. I mean, the, this, what we talk about here is very much based on the computational ability to manage the Earth resources correctly. So these are very important, very important fields. So I would definitely recommend that as a general distinction. But to finish that point, just. Anyway, if you're frustrated, don't tr try to balance your life, as I try to do my best, between your basic survival and trying to promote something that you feel is important for your future and your family's future, if you have kids, obviously their future, and realize that it's a, just a very noble thing to promote in and of itself. Maybe and I'll it come and work for you then as a salesman or something like that. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry? I could come work for you as a salesperson, maybe. There you go. Get it out there. <laughs> if I had any money to pay you, of course. <laughs> you got to the, the, uh, Hi, Peter. This Hi. question relates to uh, the media conditioning. I just want to know how mindful you are of the conditioning effect that your movies have on people who see them and how responsible you feel in relation to the honesty about how things are likely to change going forwards in terms of social collapse and that kind of thing, and whether it's possible to project a better way to transition, a better way that we can go forwards uh, that could be more acceptable and more humane overall. Well, I'm not advocating a breakdown. I'm not. Sh I'm not. I don't want to see people suffer. I'm. 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 A, I'm beside everything. I'm watching what's happening and reporting what I observe and the research that I've done. So when I explain the collapse in the film, as, as despairing as it may be, it's simply an observation. And you know, in the film itself, I don't talk about you know the actual transition. And the ending is a big gesture. It's really this catharsis against this kind of monetary reality and all the things that go with it. But as far as positivity of transition, the sad thing is biosocial pressure is what really influence people in their change. It takes stressors to get people to be motivated one way or another. They can be intellectual and they can rationalize and make decisions, but generally speaking, people tend to tend to maneuver themselves based on what the environment is dictating. So I think it's a natural consequence. First of all, if the system worked, let's put this out in the open, if, this, if the free market, the free-for-all market as I call it, if it actually worked, then why would I be here? I, if everything was in balance, then there'd be no reason to do anything. This, the resource-based economy is an answer to the failure of a, an evolutionarily flawed system. So I see the, dis, the, the despairing, uh, attributes, uh, the, the conflict, the instability as a natural evolution out of this system, unfortunately, which will serve as a motivator intrinsically and inherently for the population to realize that they have to do something new and that it's time to start looking for new solutions and a, essentially for a new social system that, where these things simply don't happen. You know? Yeah, I, I agree with the observations. I just wonder if there's if it's possible for us to design a better way for the transition well, to happen. Well, I'd love to. I'd love happen. to see it. Sure, I'd love to see other people uh, take a shot at it. I'm doing the best that I can in a way that I think is balanced and, and just you know honest. You know, and of course, it, it's a movie. Speaking of the media quote conditioning, so I do have, generate an aesthetic for it through music and everything else to give a sense of emotional impression. But um, if you break just down the down the data and you read the script, you know that's. It is what it is, but I encourage anyone out there, all of us, anyone can be a filmmaker now, anyone can do anything in media, to investigate other means, and I'd certainly love to see it. So if you come up with a way, please send it to me. I'd love to see that gesture. Yeah, we're all working on it, I'm sure. Thank you. Okay. In your resource-based economy, there will still be jobs of some sort, whether it's even scientists, technicians, engineers, computer designers, whatever. Right. Now, 
I've got a job, but my next door neighbor hasn't. Isn't that creating inequality? And, and why should I do the job anyway? Oh, say the last part again. And why should I do my job anyway? My next door neighbor, he's, he's, he's doing pottery all day, you know, he's, he's quite happy. Does he have, what does he have, financial support? Does he financial Well, you're saying everybody's got abundance. What, uh, well, no, what, if I understand you correctly, the, the labor that's required in a resource-based economy is substantially minimal than what you see today. And the big difference between what you're doing in a resource-based economy versus what you're doing today, on, on, in most, most cases at least, is that it has a direct social tie. It supports you just as it supports everyone else. So it's a tr different train of thought. You, if you develop a value system, all of us have things that we like to do, things that we enjoy doing, and I think many of those things have to do with some type of labor, if you consider it as such. Investigative things. I love research. I read lots of books. I like to, to invent things whenever I have time to do so. I am certainly happy. I would personally be perfectly happy to run part of the city system just for my own satisfaction to know that it's going to keep the system working. It's going to be efficient in the appreciation of everyone else. You could exchange the labor where your commitment, commitment in a resource-based economy, say in the city structure, would be nominal, so nominal to the effect of just a few hours a week in this rotation that everyone in the society works with. It's about people learning that you don't have to have monetary reward to sustain yourself. I mean, we're not that lazy, are we? You know, it's like, I really believe the conditioning of the modern culture is such that people have a knee-jerk reaction now to not want to do any type of labor. They want to get monetary reward for everything on one side simply because the labor is usually irrelevant. I mean, there's a great majority of the occupations out there serve only a monetary and employment function. They don't contribute to anything. People that, the real satisfaction of people in, uh, excuse me, of uh, the real satisfactor, excuse, the most satisfaction-oriented jobs, if that makes sense, tend to be ones that help people. I, I know lawyers that have been working for tobacco companies their whole life in the criminal enterprises, and they retired and they went straight into pro bono work just to cleanse their soul. You know, there is a natural. I think I, I believe in this society because the pressure to, for income is not, is removed because the needs, the necessities of life, the needs of society is managed and maintained. That's the design of society and access abundance. People will volunteer left and right to want to contribute and to help. The improvement that they make to the society is an improvement that comes back to them. Self-interest becomes social interest in this type of arrangement. And I think I really, even if, even if you had 40% of the society utterly lazy, you still only need a fraction of the other percentage to, to pick up the slack. And I guarantee you that they'd be happy to do so too. So you don't think people with jobs and people without jobs would in, in itself create some sort of inequality? I don't, I, don't, I, I don't believe, first of all, that no one would, quote, just not do anything. And I think <laughs> that people would want to help. I think you, people would have their artistic, personal interests, but I do deeply believe that, I mean, in America, one of the most capitalist and self-indulgent and narrow societies on the planet that's been utterly groomed into this horrible state of mind um, of just blind, naked self-interest, they have, we have in America, uh, a volunteerism that I believe it's in the companion guide. You remember what it is, Tom? Do you remember the, the statistics on volunteers in America? But it was colossal. I couldn't believe it when I read it. 45%. It was, it was amazing to see how many people, most people, by the way, that volunteer are actually in the lower income brackets, which I found fascinating, too. Those that are most rewarded in the system are much, much less likely to contribute. It's those that actually see the basis of humanity, that, that live in the common world. They're the ones that want to help. So that's another tidbit for you to consider. So... People will do so. They've proven it. Uh, we have a huge, huge uh, volunteer, uh, uh, nonprofit volunteer sector, if you will. And in fact, there's a book I recommend uh, that talks about that explicitly called The End of Work by Jeremy Rifkin. I recommend that to you because it's a really brilliant point that he makes. And he's not actually an advocation of what we talk about. I try to get in touch with him. It doesn't matter. But he, he at least points this out specifically that in the future, because of the automation of labor, because of the lack of of ability for people, majority of people to be employed, other sectors will come into fruition and they'll be very, very different. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that particular angle, but his, his understanding of the nonprofit sector as a base support where in a society where everyone is trained to be as capitalistic and ruthless as possible is an amazing, to me, testament of some deep down human attribute that really does want to help each other. 
and they're willing to do so. So I checked that book out if you wanted more information on that point. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hi. Um, Paul, I came all the way from Chicago to talk to you. Long, long oh, flight. Great. So, pardon <laughs> So basically, forgive me if I kind of go on for just a moment, just grant me a little time, because I put in time to get here. I've been working kind of behind the scenes on how to do that transition that this gentleman and the, the more mature gentleman in the back spoke about, and I think that it would be a fantastic way, but I wanted to kind of preface that by asking you some questions. Okay. Uh, so people want to do more, and many simply don't have the time, resources, or influence to get out there and say, hi, this is what we would like to do, how about you jump on board? Because they have jobs, because they have debt, because they're gonna to continue to have bills and things that are gonna keep them mentally drained outside of what media is doing already. So how would you suggest the tired people do? Well, what would you suggest for these tired people to do or how to, how to get them into a transitory state outside of simply spamming links sure. to, to their friends to try to get them to check out this information? Well, again, that, that's a... That's, a, I think, a per-case basis type of question. You know, for the average wage slave that's you know, racked in debt and can't think about anything, forget any type of social activism, they're not concerned about, you know, the, the Middle East wars, you know, they, they, everything's locked in. This is actually, in my mind, I think, intrinsically built in the system as an aside, the distraction of this, this oppressive um, deprivation that, is, that permeates, especially now, is serves the establishment in a strange way because it keeps people so narrowly encompassed. And that's, that's essentially your point. So they, can't, they don't have the means or the energy to think about these things because they can barely take care of themselves. Right. It's, a sad, it's a sad state of social control, I think, is somewhat, somewhat realistic in the minds of those that, that are around that want to maintain their power establishment. But I don't want to pull out, it's not a conspiratorial notion, it's a natural kind of natural element gravitation of the system for people to maintain their positions. But to answer your question, I think you'd have to take it on a per case basis and speak with the position, each individual, get their background and get them to relate the fact that what they're doing, most likely, uh, well, first of all, their entire position, of course, is, in, is oppressive because of the system, so there's, there's point one. And then you hone up to their actual level of, of, of uh, personal their actual personal relationship level of what their occupation is. Do they have a family? Oh, you see what I mean? You can't just blank, I can't blanketly tell you, or in fact, goes for almost any kind of communication, some universal to approach anyone. But you know, if they're stuck in a position of debt, you're gonna have a hard time one way or another. If they're narrowly defined, if they can barely support themselves. But just remind them that the oppressive system is what's keeping them down. And if they want out of it, they have to make some type of stride, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a good point. It kind of possibly leads into the next question I had about, uh, in the film, a dollar amount was referred to in terms of what it costs to go to war and how much, if that money were to be put towards building infrastructure, how it could have been done on a global basis. Is there a particular dollar amount that it would cost or, or take to initiate either a survey or building this test city? Yeah, that's a good question. I asked Chalk about the test city, and um, I can't remember the... Uh, carrying capacity of that city, but he, at that stage he said it was rather small and he, he quoted about a billion dollars, which I think might have been rather low, but it's really hard to financially foreshadow any of that. The survey is something that really has almost been done in a lot of ways already by, by private corporations. It's simply getting that data. But we can't even get straight data out of the oil companies anymore. I mean, it's really hard when you have proprietary institutions that want to protect their self-interest. And since scarcity is one of the biggest drivers of demand, at least profitable demand, you you enter into a world that you really can't get honest information. So it's really just stopping it and making them give the information that they have at one level. Right. And then it's using advanced technologies to, to scour the earth and survey, which there are many, many forms of uh, radiation technology that can be used to see uh, lots of attributes. There's a lot of technical things you can do, which would be extremely expensive. In my view, it would be done without expense. Right. I, I really, you know, because you really can't, you can't build this thing from the basis of money. You have to go straight to the resources and resource management and do it efficiently. You have to do it right, not with the price cost, excuse me, the cost efficiency, which will in inevitably hinder you. So I can, really can't answer that question. It's hard to... I mean, it was only in a sense to reference it of... of, of uh, I've got to move on that because that's two questions, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Give somebody else a chance. Anybody on the right I, here? I'll, I'll talk to you after if you would. Yeah. We'll catch up. 
Uh, hello. Um, one of the problems I've found uh, in society today is um, a lot of people have such short attention spans. So when I send them the link to this film and they see two hours and 40 minutes, they immediately close it and I can't, I can't handle that, you know. I can't watch that. Um, anything that's more than three minutes long, people just don't have the time. You know, they're, they're too busy playing their games, oh, watching yeah. their vain entertainment, you know, X Factor and all this nonsense and every time you send I, I have a lot of friends online that I talk to I send them links I show them these things and they just simply cannot be bothered what do we do about people like that how do we get these people to see and to realize and to understand that these are the kind of things that they need to be interested in and need to talk about and think about I, I think in communication you just have to be more severe in your communic in your, your reasoning for watching the film you know one of the kind of uh, second thoughts that, well, inadvertent realities of the way the films are constructed is they're in sections. So I recommend maybe sending sections, say, oh, watch this section of the monetary system. It's, you know, part, part two. And, you know, they, or, why, or if you know people that are interested in sociology and human behavior, oh, we got to see this section on part one regarding human behavior and human nature. I don't know, try to do something like that, but I, I hear you. I made the film two hours. I could have made it much longer, by the way. I, <laughs> I kind of wish you did. Yeah, I almost broke it into two films, but I, you know, I wanted to be as, as concise as possible, but yet not miss anything, because I got so tired of people complaining about addendum and, you know, all the things, because it just brings up everything and then it doesn't explain it, because, you know, it's, again, it's a two-hour film, um, and it wasn't, the intent wasn't to be fully based there, but moving forward certainly was. So I, I did that distinctly because I knew that, if, I believe that, you know, most people really do watch it, though. I mean, the four million views on YouTube, and some people have said they've seen it, like, 20 times. I'm like, God, you really sat through the thing 20 times? I've seen times? it about eight. Well, <laughs> see, there you go. See, it's just not, so it's not universal. So if you encounter people that simply don't want to take the time, I guess just move on and go to the next, you know, the next subject. Yeah. Um, are you planning to do the next movie about how to get there? Well, you'll um, have a lot of ideas, I'm sure. The thing about how to get there, it's not really conducive into a movie format because as I was mentioning, it's, and that's why I ended it the way I did, as a very overarching aesthetic gesture, emotional gesture, a cathartic gesture. Uh, the transition is so unpredictable. There's so many things that could happen that would completely change the path, not necessarily the direction of where we want to go, but, but who knows what could happen in, as, as the instability that's obviously showing itself now continues to go. So I'm going to make more presentations in the movement and more documents in the movement. I've already, I talk about it, I've talked about it at length in different contexts, but I do plan to make a transition, uh, narrated, simple, though not a movie, it probably won't have any music, to describe other you know, angles for that. Because the ability to dream is the, is the main, is the strongest and, and the main ability of human being. Sure, yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I um, just want to say thanks for a great film. Um, my question is just purely curious. Following on from that gentleman's comment over there about trying to shorten the information so that right. people can. Um, I'm wondering, I'm sure you've been asked, or I'm wondering what, if you thought it was possible to reduce the ideas in all three films into maybe 17 or 24 minutes. I'm talking about <laughs> possibly doing a... I mean, I'm talking about, have you ever th considered doing a TED talk, something like that? All right, well, I mean, the, well, all three films. The first film is its own little, its own life because it it was before my interest emerged in this sustainable resource-based economy, which emerged at the end of Addendum. So there's kind of a divide between the three films right in the center as far as their context. Obviously, they're interrelated in the you know, corruption level and all of that stuff and what the system reinforces and, and all of that. Uh, I, uh, I have offers for TEDx I'm, I'm going to be doing. There's, there, there's different TED arrangements. and Obviously, I will do my best in the 20-minute time frame uh, when I have those opportunities. And, you know, like tomorrow, I'm reducing my, what usually is like a three hour type of lecture to 45 minutes, which has been brutal enough. So I'm doing my best. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay.
having been to a number of these meetings over the last couple of years, uh, I was just wondering, does the uh, notion of pressure upon you, uh, has that grown, increased as the movement has grown in stature? Do you feel any sort of weight of responsibility for... There's a lot of what do you expect us to do? These sort of questions come up time and time again, and I just wonder how that affects you personally. Well, uh, yeah, I, I've uh, been able to reconcile that internally with the basic understanding, which I talk about a lot, is that I'm only one individual. While people might look to me, and as obviously people are asking me questions, which I appreciate, and I have done a great deal of research, and that's pretty much all I'm doing now, so I, I, I like to provide as much information as I can, and hopefully that will be digested and built upon. Simultaneously, I, I've been able to condition myself to not feel like I am now responsible for anything in this. I'm just like anyone else. And I say that constantly to people. As a founder, I'm an initiator. I'm, I'm not a, I definitely don't like the term leader, as you know from many of my general rhetoric, because it implies that Thank I you, have Tom. all the answers, you know. I deploy, or Jacques as a leader or anything. That we don't need leaders anymore. We need people to actually be educated. Leaders is a, is a corrupt concept. The, the leadership and, and uh, well, Leadership and peasant relationship, I can't think of another word for it. Leadership and public relationship is really power strangulation because the public can't be educated for leaders to be maintained. And that's why we have a basically a dumbed down type of arrangement throughout the entire world and the restriction of information uh, throughout the dawn of time since the divinity of kings. It's been all about restricting information from the masses so the leadership can remain power, maintain power. And that's what we have to get over. So I emphatically want people to become their own leader, as I say, or in the words of like Judo Krishnamurti, who knew very well about that concept and it's like I used to but I do feel pressure, obviously, standing here, you know, I have a tremendous obligation and I, do, I'm, I am compelled to do as much as I can and I do get dissatisfied if I don't feel I've committed things properly and things like that or let people down. And of course, everyone scrutinizes everything I say now. I, I can't make any statement without somebody, you know, anything that's slightly ambiguous, you'll see some blog taking it out of context and creating a new subcontext for it. Suddenly I'm advocating Nazism or something, you know, this is, so I have to be very careful now with pretty much everything I say. So it does become stressful, I definitely admit that, but I also understand it. 